It is good to start seeing our crowd gather back together on Wednesday night. Appreciate you being here. Uh, we do, as I said, uh, if you're not able to be here on Wednesday night, we do record these uh, and try to have them up by Thursday. Um, sometimes I just plumb forget. I'm not going to lie to you and forget. I was like, oh, I never put it back up. Um, but we try to have them up for you uh, within the day uh, of those. And so if you have to miss a Wednesday, hopefully you can catch it and, and catch up with it. Uh, especially with this because one lesson is building on the other as we're studying through the book of Acts. All right? The last time we looked at Acts chapter 13, we actually spent two weeks in there uh, as Paul set out on his first missionary journey. Uh, and I told you that we're, we're seeing a transition in the book of Acts. Uh, what was that transition? Let's see if we have a better response than we did last Wednesday. All right, we know the Taylors know. Anybody else? I know Sue knows because she said it last week. All right, go ahead, Sam. Change from looking at Peter to looking at Paul. All right, we are changing kind of directions here. The first half of the book is kind of dealing with the, the early church ministry, specifically that of Peter. Uh, and the last part is the actual building of the church, um, uh, which is more with Paul. Uh, and really, uh, you, you may also say, as we'll look at tonight, the first half of the book of Acts dealt with the Jews, whereas the last half of the book of Acts deals with the Gentiles, uh, because that's who mainly Paul went and, and spoke to. He spoke to the Jew first, but when they wouldn't hear what he had to say, then he went to the Gentiles, okay? Uh, and so the remainder of the book will follow Paul through his missionary journeys. Uh, he, along with the help of others, would establish churches, uh, many of those churches later on in the New Testament would actually receive letters uh, from Paul. He would write these letters to them to help them with something that they were going through, to give instructions, to give guidance. Uh, again, all of this was new, so he would uh, send the letters to, to help them establish uh, the church and to keep the church uh, running. And so we see those throughout the New Testament. Um, we move now into chapter 14, and we see Paul and Barnabas. If you'll remember, I mentioned them last time. Uh, Paul, Barnabas, and then John Mark were all on the missionary journey together. Uh, John Mark left and went back home, uh, and so that left uh, Paul and Barnabas. Uh, and so we started looking at a couple of places that they had been last week, uh, but we'll continue that as we go into chapter number 14. Uh, the first place that we see is Paul and Barnabas. Um, in Acadium we see here verses 1 through 7. Uh, first we look at the conversions here in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass... Uh, in, Ac in Acadium, uh, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of Jews and also Greeks, believed. Uh, as I mentioned last time, Paul enters into every city with the same plan. He preaches to who first? The Jews. Okay? Uh, in other words, he goes and visits what building? The synagogue, okay, that's where the Jews would meet. He's in the synagogue. Uh, and when they would no longer listen to him, then he would take the message to the Gentiles. Well, we see as he enters in this city that uh, as he goes, he's actually pretty well received there uh, in the synagogue. The Bible says that, that both the Jews and the Greeks, now Greeks means what? Gentiles, okay, don't let that confuse you. By the way, if you're not a Jew, you're what? Gentiles, only two options, okay? Uh, and so uh, he was received by both uh, very well. It says that many uh, believed on there. Um, and then look at verse uh, 3. Well, let me go ahead and read down through verse 7, and then we'll come back. It says, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. A long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which came testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders. Uh, to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, uh, with their rulers, to use them <clears throat> despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of... of um, where did I go? Verse 6, I'm sorry. Lake Aniah, and unto the re unto the region that the, that lieth around about. Excuse me, while I clean my glass, I've got a spot on here. And there they preached the gospel. All right. So 
Um, we see here that in, in verse 3 that Paul did not just preach and run when he got to this city. Uh, he actually stayed there teaching them the ways of the Lord. Uh, by the way, I think that's one of the big problems that we have today is that people make decisions for Christ, but they don't stick around long enough to be discipled. Uh, they come in, they got saved up, got my ticket to heaven, and I just going out here and live however I want to. Uh, and they never get discipled. They never learn the gospel. They never learn the word of God and how to live for God. Um, but we see here that we're also able to see him uh, live what he preached. Uh, and so uh, as he stayed there, it wasn't just a message that he had. They were actually able to see this message put into action. He was giving evidence of the truth of God's Word. So uh, it's not only words that he was speaking. Uh, they, they could see the evidence of the words. Um, he evidently, according to the, this verse, did some signs and wonders. Uh, and again, the reason for these signs and wonders, as we've told you in the past, they didn't have the Scriptures. Now I can say Paul said this, it's in the Gospel, that settles it. Amen? It's in this book, that settles it. There ain't no argument about it. We, it's either all true or none of it's true. Uh, they didn't have that. All right, The New Testament church didn't have all of these yet. And so God would give these apostles and disciples, He would give them um, uh, the, the ability to perform some of these miracles, signs, and wonders so that the people would know that, yes, this person truly was of God. They were who they said they were. Okay, And so we see that uh, here with uh, Paul, that they're able to do that. Uh, then we see the contrast here in verse number 4. Um, as with any time we must make decisions for truth, we will see division. Um, we look at our world today, division. Uh, anytime there's a decision to be made, some are going to be on one side of it, some are going to be on the other. You say, well, it's truth. Everybody ought to be on the side of truth. I wish that it worked that way, but it doesn't always work that way. Paul's message divided the city in half. Some received it, some rejected it. We need to understand not all are going to receive the gospel. Uh, and, and I look at that and people say, well, I just don't understand. Why won't they believe? You know, you know why you think that? Because you believe. Alright? How many like coffee? Coffee. Coffee. How many like coffee? I don't understand it. I don't like coffee. Coffee's nasty. <laughs> you know? I mean, so I, I don't like it. it. It's just, you know, and, and, and some of y'all just look at me like, are you crazy? You don't like coffee? Why? Because we didn't agree on something. So one of us must be crazy because I didn't agree on it, okay? Uh, and, and, but we're like that. We do that. Uh, and, and we see it not only in, in small things of life, but we see it in big things of life. We need to understand just because you receive the gospel doesn't mean everybody will. Uh, you can't beat them with it. You can't force them out. You can't knock somebody on the ground, twist their arm, say you believe, say you believe. It doesn't work that way. Either they receive it or they don't receive it. You can't argue somebody into heaven. You can't argue somebody into believing. You can present truth, you can present facts, and then they have to do something with those facts. Okay? Um, but the gospel separates. And, and by the way, Jesus, through his teaching, let us know that. We've seen it. I've seen it uh, come between friendships, I've seen it divide families. I've seen it uh, divide churches as some are, are, are not as willing to take a stronger stand on the truth as others are. Uh, and people get divided because this is what I believe, this is what I want to do, and that's it. That settles it. And people say, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. And, so they're, and, and it causes division. The Bible says that the Bible divides asunder. All right? If it divides the thoughts and intents of the hearts... Imagine what it does to groups of people, especially if you're one that is doing something that the Bible says not to do. Uh, I have this discussion with people all the time, that discussion of alcohol. The preacher of the Bible doesn't say you can't drink. The Bible says that don't be drunk. You know why people want to use that argument? They drink. They want to drink. That's, that's why they use the argument. I know one sure way not to get drunk. Anybody know what it is? Don't drink. Don't drink. 
Everybody thinks, oh, I can control it. I can handle it. I can hold it. I can control it. Yep, until you can't. You know when you find out that you can't? When it's too late. <laughs> By the way, I'm not going to say all. Most alcohol that is served today would qualify when the Bible says do not drink strong drink. It would qualify under that. Okay? Uh, and so when people say, well, you know, it's, yes, the Bible didn't come out and talk about cores or Michelob. And, and our, they didn't have all that. All right? They didn't talk about beer. They didn't talk about wine. They didn't talk about wine coolers. didn't talk about... But, but just about everything that's out there today would be under that. But that's where, pe that's where divisions. By the way, people divide churches. They divide families. They divide over that. Why? Because somebody says, you know, we're standing strong on this. And somebody says, no, we're not. That's what the Bible does. You've got to decide, here is the truth. Do I believe it and want to live by it, or, or do I not? This is the idea behind what Jesus says here. Luke in, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Is Jesus teaching hate? That's what he said, right? But we got to hate everybody. Is he teaching hate? No. What he is saying, in your willingness to follow me, everything else ought to seem like hatred. In other words, you ought to be so dedicated to the truth of my word, to following my word, to following the gospel, that everything else, you need to be willing to let everything else go to stand on the truth. Is what he's saying. Why? I don't care what relationship you have here. Your time here is limited. Now, would you rather go through that and, and have, you know just just live in my own comfort zone for a hundred years? How many y'all will live a hundred years? I don't know. Way I feel now, I pray not. Okay, because I don't know if I feel this bad now. Hundred's not going to be fun. But are you willing to sacrifice that hundred years for for what's coming in eternity? We have to stand on the truth. But as we see, there's some conspiracy. Um, I told you Sunday that, that we, we, we kind of saw the same thing as we're following Jesus through the gospel. You know, the, the Jews didn't like what he had to teach, and so they're trying to stir things up. I told you the same thing's happening with Paul. The Jews didn't like what he had to teach. And by the way, there's some Gentiles here as well. Uh, and so they're trying to stir things up. Once again, the unbelievers try to stir up problems. And they tried to divide the people. Notice they didn't, they, they didn't go after Paul, his teaching. Why? Because it was truth. What do you think they could do about that? So let's divide the people. Because if we can divide the people, if we can cause chaos, then we can keep anything from, from happening together. Anybody ever tried to work a puzzle with a four-year-old? How much of that puzzle do you think is going to get worked? Won't happen. Because as you're trying to put together, they're trying to what? That's what the devil tries to do in churches. He tries to get in there, have somebody, you know, messing things up. So what God's trying to build, that's being torn down just as quick as it can get built up. And if the devil can do that, he's won. Have you ever noticed, though, that it's the unbeliever that wants to initiate or instigate the problems? I offer you a message. I preach the gospel. Receive it or reject it. I've not come to your house and threatened you. I've not, uh, you know, tried to hurt you. I've just preached what the Word of God says. And you've got to decide what? Either accept it or reject it. That's it. But the unbeliever wants to come in and, oh, the church is, is preaching against homosexuality. Let's destroy the church. Basically, you can have an opinion, but we can't. Isn't that the way our society works today? All right. If you don't like what we're teaching against homosexuality, guess what? Don't listen. Don't come. Reject it. Go on about your business. 
By the way, I'm not coming to your house and sitting out on your front porch and with a sign saying, this person's going to hell. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Why? I'm going to present the gospel to them. I'm going to present the truth, the way out. If they accept it, that's up to them. I can't make them... Again, I can't throw them on the arm and... Boy, there are some people I wish I could. I wish I could put them on the ground and, and you know, like you said, say uncle, no, say you believe, say you believe. But they want to go around and attack and, and, and uh, you know, try to destroy. Well, they get the people here so stirred up that they're ready to stone them for preaching the gospel. It's not they just simply wouldn't listen. They said, you know, we're gonna, we're not, we're not gonna listen to you. We're gonna shut you up for good. We're gonna stone you. We're gonna kill you. Well, hearing about the plot, they leave and they head on to the next city. Uh, some say that they uh, uh, should have stayed. They, oh, they should have trust God. They should have just stayed where they were and, and trust God to protect them. Remember what we've been talking about. Uh, I told you that they learned to live to fight another day. Sometimes God would tell you stay. That's what happened with Stephen. God told Stephen to stay, and what happened? He got stoned. Okay? Well, God didn't tell Paul to stay, so he didn't stay. If you remember, Jesus, when he was tempted in the wilderness, he told Jesus, took him up there and says, says, jump, the angels will catch you. What, what was Jesus' answer to the devil? You will not tempt the Lord. Okay? And that's the thing. Say, well, I'm just going to stay. Well, if God didn't tell you to stay and you say, I'm just going to stay, you're tempting God. You're saying, okay, God, you have to protect me because I'm not going to listen to you and I'm going to stay. But learn to fight another, live to fight another day. And that's what, what Paul does here. And so we see the next stop, Paul and Barnabas and Lystra in verses 8 through 20. First of all, we, they see him come in contact with a crippled man. Look at verse number 8. And there sat a certain man in Lystra, uh, um, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had a faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. We see here a man who has never walked from, from birth. He's never walked. He heard Paul speak and, and he believed the words that Paul was saying. Uh, he had confidence in the power of this Jesus that Paul was preaching about. Well, somehow this caught Paul's attention and, and Paul was able to, to sense this man's faith. That he was believing what it was that he was saying. And so Paul commands him with a loud voice, says, get up! Now, if that's you, you hadn't walked from birth, and this guy tells you to get up, how many of you get up? You mean tell you who gets up? The one with faith. That shows that Paul was right. He had sensed faith in this man. Because when Paul says, get up, he got up. And I love what the Bible says. He says, he leaped and walked. <laughs> It may be no significance to, uh, to, to leap being said first, but, but it sure got my attention. You'd think he'd walk first and then leap. No, the Bible says he leaped around and then walked. <laughs> Paul said, get up, so he got up. By the way, I wonder how many miss the blessings of God because we will not do what we're told to do. Amen. I wonder how many times God's told us, get up. I don't know. I ain't never walked before. And you won't today. Why? Because you don't have enough faith to follow God and do what God said to do. Then we see the confusion, verses 11 through 14. And when Paul saw, and when people saw that what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of the Laodicean, like Lycodians, the gods are come down to us in likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and called and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of, of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates uh, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, 
they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. So the first thing that we see is this assumption by the people in verses 11 and 12. Uh, the crowd seeing this miracle, they think that Paul and Barnabas are what? Gods. Okay? Uh, Paul, uh, or Barnabas, Juniper, he's the, the Greek uh, Zeus. He's considered the Greeks and the Romans uh, as the uh, greatest of the gods, the father of the gods. Um, and, and then uh, Paul here is uh, Mercury's. Uh, or the Greek Hermas, regarded as the god of eloquence because he was the one doing the speaking, okay? Um, and so we see in verses 13 and 14, the acts of the people, they began to, to prepare an offering, to sacrifice to these gods. They're, they're getting ready to come and bring sacrifices before uh, Paul and Barnabas. And uh, we see the, chief, uh, or the grief expressed by Paul and Barnabas by doing what? All right. What does it mean when the Bible talks about renting their clothes? Now, I understand it means to rip their clothes, but, but it was a symbol of what? Mourning. mourning or great grief. Okay. What was Paul mourning? What was Barnabas mourning? People didn't have facts straight. They, they didn't understand. They missed the message. Paul is trying to point to God. And instead, these people tried to make Paul a god. And it grieved Paul that he missed it, that they missed it. Think about that. How many preachers do we have today, and I use the word very lightly, that think they're gods? And allow their people to treat them like they're gods? It's not about them, it's about Him. As, as I've told you many times, if, if today's my last day on this earth, man, I, I hope somebody might shed a tear. I hope somebody go to Olive Garden and have chicken parmesan <laughs> on my behalf. Mm -hmm. But come Sunday, you better have somebody, Sam or somebody down there preaching and, and, and get the gospel out. Why? Because it wasn't about me. It's about God. All right? Uh, and that's how it ought to be. That's how it should be. Okay? Uh, we ought to, everything we do ought to point to God. It's not about us, it's about Him. Uh, and if somehow the people are worshiping us, instead of worshiping God, we've missed the boat. We've done something wrong. It, it bothers me when I see preachers leave the churches and people will leave church with them. Now I realize sometimes that happens because there was a big old commotion that split in the church. And I mean, we're, we're talking different things. But, but you, you're not here to worship a person, you're here to worship God. And I hope that whoever's preaching to you, or whoever you call to preach, is going to preach God. Amen. Well, we see the correction here in verses 14 through 18, or the end of 14. It says, And they ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. And nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, uh, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. So Paul quickly puts a stop to this, reminding the people of a few things. Number one, they're simply men just like they are. Paul said, we're just like you. We're just people. We're just men just like you. There's nothing special about us. And that's what we need to understand. Listen to me, church. There's nothing special about you except that you've been called of God. So we've got no right to look down our noses at the unsaved. But by the grace of God, that's us. If they don't know no better, how can we expect them to act any better? So instead of turning our nose up to them, we need to turn our hands out to them and present to them the gospel. Invite them in. Now, if once we share the gospel, once we invite them in, if they continue to reject it, you know, then they've got to answer for that. But, but by the grace of God, that's where we are. How many of you were on the right path before somebody shared the gospel with you? None of us. We could have ended up where they are. 
Number two, their message was teaching the people to turn to uh, to turn away from such gods to the true God. He said, "You're you're doing exactly the opposite of what we're teaching you to do. We're trying to turn you away from all of these gods because now the Gentiles have a lot of gods. We're trying to turn you away from those gods to the true gods, and, and here you are and bringing two more gods into the fold. We're not here for that. That's not what it's about." And then he teaches them, number three, that nations had done as they saw right in their own eyes for years, yet God had always left them with a witness to bring them to Himself. Throughout all of history. By the way, we probably live in the biggest day that there ever was of people doing that which they see as right within their own eyes. Has God left a witness? Look around you. We're it. Now, Questions: If we're not witnessing, <clears throat> what good did it do for God to leave a witness if we're not going to do it? How many of you would go into a pitch black dark house with a flashlight in your hand and never turn it on? We have the light shining. We're in a dark, wicked world. Instead of complaining about how dark and wicked the world is, shine the light. <laughs> At least make that area around you a little bit brighter. Amen? When people focus more on the messengers than they do the message or the Messiah, we're asking for trouble. And Paul wanted to put a stop to that very quickly. Then in verses 19 and 20, we see the conspiracy. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and... Um, Iconium, who, who persuaded the people and having, stoned, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And so, once again, some of the Jews came in to stir up the trouble for Paul. Uh, the crowd turns against Paul, and in fact, they did what? Exactly what they wanted to do, wasn't it? They stoned him. In fact, they thought he was dead. They did what you do to a dead person, which was what? Drag him out of the city, out of the gates. And they left him there for dead. But as you can see, God said, hold on. <laughs> We're not finished quite yet. And Paul rose up. And what did he do? Where was Barnabas? Didn't he go back into the city? He rose up and came what? Into the city. Verse 20. He went right back to where? Where it was stone. Now, he got Barnabas and they left. But how many of you just got stoned, left for dead, walk yourself back into the city that just stoned you? Hey, little boy, I'll give you a dollar if you go in there and tell Barnabas I'm hiding behind this tree out here. <laughs> Come meet me here at this tree. That sound about more like what we might do? <laughs> it tells you the confidence that Paul had. Now, the first city, he left. They were turning on him and he left. This city, they're turning on him and he what? Stayed. What was the difference? One time God let him out. One time God let him go through it. But both times God saw him through it. Amen? What am I telling you, church? Whether you, whether you leave before the stoning or after the stoning, God will see you through it. We just got to trust God. We well, say, preacher, you mentioned Stephen earlier. What about Stephen? Did God not see him through it? When that stoning was over, Stephen was in better shape than any of us are in. Right? Amen? Amen? Brother Willie and I talked one day out in the, in the parking lot here when he come by the house, we were talking. I said, one way or the other, God's going to heal you. Amen? Amen? Don't care what your sickness is, one way or the other, God's going to heal you. Whether it be medically here, or whether it be over here and heal for eternity, one way or the other, God's going to heal us. Stay true to Him and He will see you through. Look at verse 21, Paul and, Dar and, Paul, and Dar Paul and Barnabas in Derby, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to, the, to that city 
and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Okay, uh, and so not much information is given here, just simply that, that this was a stop on the way. They preached there, uh, and then they did what? Turned around and started going back. Why would they go back through these cities that they had already been through? Well, maybe. But probably something a little bit more important than that. Encourage new believers. Okay. Let's look at what they did. Here, look at verse 22 as we see Paul and Barnabas begin to backtrack. This is why they backtrack. Look at verse 22. Number one, to strengthen, or as Sam said, to encourage the believers. Look, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. The confirming souls, in other words, instructing them and establishing them. Uh, secondly, exhorting them, encouraging them to stand strong in the faith. You know, uh, again, if I just watch Paul get stoned, I might not want to go that path he went down. Amen? How many need encouragement to stand strong? We do. And then to prepare themselves. Trials and tribulations were coming, and Paul needed to prepare them. So Paul goes back. Remember, he's establishing churches. And once we establish them, we've got to go back and check on them. We can't just, we can't just let them go. Uh, and so Paul's going back now. They've had some time to kind of get things rolling. So Paul's going back now to encourage them. Hang in. Stay in there. How many of you remember getting saved? How many of you remember? You got saved. You got up from that altar, coffee table, wherever it may have been, you know, uh, out, the, out the car seat or whatever it was. And, and you went out and, and just life was just grand. You got saved and, and the devil stayed off your back and everything was just perfect from then on out, right? How many about a week, two weeks after you got saved needed somebody to come along and encourage you? He's ready to throw in the towel out harder than you thought it was. All right, that's what Paul's doing. They're going back and, and encouraging, confirming, strengthening the brethren. Now, the second part of this is selecting leaders. Paul can't stay, but somebody's got to lead. Okay? You can't just have a bunch of sheep running around. Somebody's got to lead. Look at verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commit, commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after that uh, had, had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to um, Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word to Perga, they went down to uh, Italia and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of of God of the work which they fulfilled and when they were come and had gathered the church together they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of the faith to the Gentiles and there they abode long time with the disciples all right and so here we see that they to select these leaders as they traveled back through these churches they found those that were prepared to lead the churches notice they didn't set them up to begin with why do you think that was? <clears throat> How many of you think you ought to get up off the altar after getting saved and now all of a sudden you become a leader of the church? Because <laughs> guess what? Not everybody that makes a decision at the altar sticks with it. So now they've, now they've been in there. And, and guess what? What I've noticed in a group, uh, Wanda, I know you've worked at the schools. How many of you have ever been around in a group of special children? Or even like adolescents, you, oh, a little older children. You put a group of children together, and I guarantee you before long, a leader's going to pop up. Amen? Really any group of people. You stick all of us in a room right here, and you give us a task, what's going to have to happen? A leader's got to pop up. So as Paul goes back through, okay, who, what leaders have popped up? Are, are these the people that are supposed to lead? Now, of course, we know God works in that too, uh, and God leads and directs in that. And so we see that, all right? Uh, and so somebody had to step up and lead, and so now that's what we're doing. They prayed over them. They fasted with them, uh, showing an effort in the selection process. They didn't just walk out and say, Man, I like that shirt. You know, Sam wears that shirt well. He'd be a good preacher. Let's throw him up here. Right, they, they prayed over it. There, were, there was a selection process. You know, they, they waited for God to do it. 
It says that they ordained them. In other words, they set them aside for the ministry. And then they turned them over to the Lord. Paul could only lead them so far. They needed to trust God for the guidance because Paul wouldn't be there. We need to remember this is going to blow your mind, but they couldn't pick up the cell phone and say, hey, Paul, I remember when I first got into the ministry and still from time to time, but my home pastor, I remember what well, first call I remember making to him, I said, you lied to me, brother. <laughs> you made this look a whole lot easier than it really is. <laughs> But I, there's, I can't count the number of times I've called home to my home church and said, said Brother Dan, I need your help with something. Can you help me with something? Or some other person in the ministry that helped guide me, direct me. You to do it. They didn't have an option. They could send Paul a letter, but it took a long time to get the letter there and a long time to get the letter back. Okay? And so these people would have to learn to rely upon God. All right? Now we know that Paul helped because that's where the letters come from. Paul started sending letters back to the church, but that took a while. Okay? Well, then we see them sailing back to Antioch in verses 26 through 28. Uh, they brought back a report to, the, uh, to their home church. Uh, they gave a testimony of their travels. Uh, by the way, I know when, when we do like a testimony service or, or like bring a missionary in here, people, oh man, we're bringing missionaries in again. I love bringing missionaries in, especially those that we have supported. Why? Men... When your lady goes out shopping and she comes home and y'all notice this is how it always happens. Help me out, Lois. You, you, don't, I, ain't, I ain't got Joe to get here in trouble. Help me out. This is what happens. Lois comes home. Joe, I saved you $100 today. Oh, <laughs> and then right, Lois, then you start pulling out all these dresses. This one was $20 off and this one was $15 off and this was... I say, you know, I didn't tell you I spent 1000 but I saved you 100 you know. <laughs> They even showed that on the receipt. There, yeah, see, they, they, yeah, now the stores even show that. You save such and such. Makes you feel good about spending all that money. Especially, go to Hamrick's one time. Go to Hamrick's and get that receipt. You save $65,392 on these two items. Where they get their markup and stuff from, I don't know. But, but, but there it is. What do we want? We want a report. You know, if this is what we spend, this is what we invest in, what do we do? You know, parents, you, you let your kids, you give them money to go get school clothes or whatever. You want to know what they got, right? All right. How many remember that first time that they brought that pair of jeans in? It looked like they had to wrestle an alligator to get them. <laughs> yeah. like, I paid 20 bucks for those. You better go back to the store and get the rest of them. Amen? All right, maybe some of y'all a little bit older for that. I don't know. But anyway. I didn't say who was older. <laughs> But, but but they uh but they give these reports okay and so and, and it's a good thing and that's what they did they brought this back and they were saying look God is working because I'm going to be honest with you when they left out I bet you there were some that didn't think they were going to succeed remember they didn't think the gospel was for the Gentiles. And I'm sure reluctantly they got behind Paul said, okay, if that's what God told you to do, and you know, we don't like it, but we can't fuss against God, and so you go do it. And so when they're bringing this report back, and Paul's telling them of all the people that have gotten saved and the churches that are getting established. I imagine that was a wonderful praise service. Amen? The Bible says they stayed a long time. And I'm sure this was to rejuvenate them, to regroup and to prepare for the next journey. And there would be another journey. In this chapter that we see God's design for building the church. And when I say the church, the big church, not just the local church. We see Paul going out with the gospel. The, the, the world will not come to us. We have to take the word out. We see Paul preaching the gospel. What other message is there? We're not here for a social gospel. We're here to preach God's word, the gospel. We're not here to build country clubs. We're here to build churches. And then we see Paul discipling the converts. It's not enough to win them. We've got to teach them. The only way we're going to keep them is if we teach them. That's why people don't understand. That's why Wednesday night services and Sunday school are so important because we get, we get to dig a little bit deeper into the Word than we can on a Sunday morning. We teach them. 
And then we see Paul persevering through the opposition. Someone will always oppose the gospel. God did not tell us to come at, that, that, that if we went after him and that it would be easy. He simply said, go. And church, that's the same plan that he has for us today. And by the way, we don't have to travel the world to do it. We can be a missionary right where we are. All we've got to be willing to do is go. I leave you tonight with the same challenge I left you with last Wednesday night. Let's commit to work till Jesus comes. If you're a believer, you have been called to be a missionary wherever you are. Whether it be sharing the gospel in um, Walmart, a restaurant, your home, your neighbors, wherever it is. I passed today, I was driving today, and I, at least I think this is what I saw. Uh, I saw a homeless man um, that, that I, I see all the time around, around town. And there was a young, I say a young kid, I say kid, he was probably in his 20s was there, it would look to be, to me, had the Bible, and just talking to him about the Lord. And what went through my head? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I give to you. This young man was giving that guy the best thing that he could. I'm not saying he didn't give, he might have gave him money, might have bought him food, I don't know. But in reality, he's giving him the best thing he could give him. And that was the Word of God. Folks, we can be a missionary wherever we go. We have that responsibility. We are the church. Yes, we want to invite people to come, but if, we're, if that's our plan of attack is just to invite people to come to the church, we'll never win this war. We have to take the church to the people. And that's you, that's me. We are the church. we got to take the gospel. So where are your missionary journeys taking you? Pray that you're witnessing. I was hoping to have a couple minutes. I've gone, actually gone over my time because I wanted to do what Paul did. I wanted to give you an opportunity to come back and give us a testimony of where you've taken the gospel and what you've seen. Think about that. We may try and fit that in next Wednesday night. But folks, we need to be busy. So I encourage you, do something this week. And, and I want to hear about it next Wednesday. You know what? I, I, I took what you said. And I decided I was going to be a missionary on this particular day, and I did this. I don't care if it was sharing a gospel track. I don't care if it was sharing a Romans road, uh, buying somebody lunch, and, and, and just talking to them about it, whatever it may have been. Let's be the church. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, again, we come to you. Just praise you and thank you for the day that you've given, for the time that you've given us in your word. And Lord, it is encouraging tonight to see, Lord, many of our folks that are coming back on our Wednesday nights, and we just pray that you continue to help that to continue to grow back to where it was. And Father, I realize we're in a very uncertain time, and Lord, we've had to make adjustments, and Lord, we've had to, to do things a little bit different. But one thing that, Lord, we cannot do different, Lord, is being the church, sharing your word. That never changes. We always have a responsibility to be missionaries bring the gospel to this lost and dying world. Lord, now more than ever, help us, Lord, to be faithful in that area. Go with us, guide us, direct us, give us the courage, the boldness, give us the words to say. Open up doors and, Lord, help us to see them. And, Lord, then help us to walk through them. And we'll give you the praise for it all in Christ's name.